Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Arts Friends of Greek Art virtual lecture, Alibi Ars, Alibi Materia, an introduction to Greek and Roman engraved gems. My name is Maria Lopez, and I'm the manager of film and lecture programs at the museum. Uh, this virtual lecture is brought to you by the Friends of Greek Art Lecture Endowment. Uh, now, before we begin with the lecture, I'd like to give everyone an overview of the agenda for today. Uh, this virtual lecture will last about an hour, our lecturer will present, and then we will have about 15 minutes for questions. Please enter any questions using the Q&A function or the chat box on Zoom. Uh, we will try our best to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, we would also like to let you know that the lecture will be recorded and made available on the NCMA YouTube page, and I will also be sharing the link to the recording with you via email. We really hope that you enjoy this lecture. And if you have any issues during the event, please let me know in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the NCMA's Director of Research and uh, Curator of Ancient Art, Caroline Rochelot. Uh, welcome, Caroline. Well, thank you, uh, Maria, for your introduction and also for your work in planning this program. Um, before we start, I would also uh, like to thank the Friends of Greek Art one of the museum's volunteer support groups who through the establishment of uh, this endowed fund makes possible this annual lecture series related to ancient Greek, Italian and Roman art and culture. Uh, of course, we would have loved to um, meet you in person for this lecture um, this year as we miss seeing your eager faces in, in the auditorium. Um, as you undoubtedly know, speakers feed off the energy of their audiences, and it's much harder to do with a virtual lecture. I know that our speaker today is disappointed not to be in Raleigh with us, and I certainly would have loved to host him at the NCMA for once. Each time that Ken and I meet, it's because I am in LA, or we're both attending the curator's dinner at the annual meeting of the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, Kenneth Patton is a graduate of UC Berkeley and the University of Oxford, trained as a classical archaeologist. He has excavated in Greece, Italy, Israel, and England, both above ground and underwater. He currently serves as the curator of antiquities at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, specifically the Getty Villa. A former fellow at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, the American Academy in Rome, and the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. He has taught ancient art at um, Boston University and UCLA. His principal research interests include the materials, techniques, and functions of ancient art, luxury, the histories of collecting and scholarship, forgery, and the intersections of ancient and post-antique art. He is the author and or editor of 17 books, including um, Chris Elephantine's Statuary in the Ancient Mediterranean World, Mysteries of the Snake Goddess, Art, Desire, and the Forging of History, and Luxus, The Sumptuous Arts of Greece and Rome. On top of that, you can add over 250 articles, reviews, and other publications. He has curated over a dozen exhibitions on topics ranging from Athenian bases, Polychromy, a polychrome statuary, Roman silver, Hellenistic bronzes, as well as medieval and later responses to antiquity, including carvers and collectors, the lasting allure of ancient gems. This last topic, ancient gems, is the subject of today's Friends of Greek Art lecture. Ken, the virtual floor is yours. Welcome virtually to North Carolina. Thank you, Caroline. Um, there we are. Hello, I'm, I'm grateful for that warm introduction to you and Maria for organizing this, this virtual lecture to the Friends of Greek Art for sponsoring it. And I too regret that I'm sitting at home in my study rather than, than with you. And I don't have the opportunity to see you all and to see, see your collection but I'm very honored to be delivering this lecture and presenting to you something that's occupied me for the past several years, which are some of the smallest but most important, arguably, and most precious 
works of ancient art valued both for the skill of the artist, that's Alibi Ars, and for the materials of the gems, Alibi Materia. Because we don't really tend to think about ancient carvings and precious stones when we think about ancient Greek and Roman art. We're used to seeing wonderful uh, buildings from Athens or Rome, sculptures in marble and bronze, uh, paintings, whether on vases, ceramics, or on frescoes. This is the kind of Renaissance triad of what art is, architecture, sculpture, and painting. But there was no such hierarchy in the ancient world. Alongside sculptors, architects, and painters, ancient writers uh, praised many other uh, workmen, silversmiths, as well as gem engravers and that great writer from antiquity, the elder Pliny, who wrote 37 books of his natural history, began the final book of his natural history, book 37, the culmination of this massive encyclopedia trying to collect all the knowledge of the ancient world. The 37th book was devoted to gems. And Pliny wrote at the very beginning, for a great many people, a single gemstone alone is enough to provide the highest and most perfect aesthetic experience of the wonders of nature. And in the next about 45 minutes before we have time for questions, I want to show you some of the reasons for this. Uh, here is a selection of just six engraved gemstones of different materials uh, in the Getty collections. We were very fortunate uh, in 2019 to be able to acquire several gemstones from a private collection, some of which had been known since the Renaissance to add to our already rich collection. And you can see here blown up on the screen, almost perfectly preserved, sometimes scratched, broken and chipped, but very much close to the state in which they left the carver's workshop. These hard stone carvings on a miniature scale, all of these, except for the one in the lower right, are about the size you know, of, of the joint of your thumb or so. These are miniature works carved with great, great skill in different materials. These are today considered semi-precious stones. Uh, they're not you know, the, the uh, precious gems of today, although the ancients did know uh, sapphires, rubies, and diamonds, but most of them are in other materials. But before we get to the materials, um, I want to distinguish between the two main techniques. All of the gems here uh, in different colors, different transparencies um, are carved in intaglio. And that's a modern Italian term. And you can remember it because tagliare in intaglio uh, is the, from the verb uh, to cut in Italian. That's tagliatelle is, is cut pasta. And these gems are all cut uh, into uh, the stone, and that's so that they would be make a relief when impressed in clay. And that's the intaglio technique. And if you look very closely at any of these gems, and here's an example in the uh, North Carolina Museum of Art, uh, Chalcedony intaglio, uh, a, a clearish gray translucent stone showing uh, Bacchus and Ariadne, if you look at the detail on the right, you can see really where the cuts are made into the stone with a variety of different tools. Here's an example at the Getty uh, where I have some sharper photographs. This is a scene common in painting and sculpture from antiquity showing the Trojan hero Aeneas who leaves the city of Troy when it's been sacked by the Greeks. He carries on his back his father Anchises and the household gods. He leads by, his, by the hand his son Ascanius, leaving the gates of Troy. A Greek soldier has already taken the city. He holds a torch, it's at night, there's a star, and he heads for his, for his ship. And you can see on the right, in the walls of the city, and the crenellations of the walls, the cuts made by uh, rotating tools 
uh, inserted into a spindle, or you might call it a lathe. And this is a selection of modern tools uh, made of steel, some with copper heads, some even with wood or felt on the right for polishing. This is a, a laborious process uh, carved uh, very much today the way it was done in antiquity, but with harder metal tools and electric uh, power rather than hand tools. But if we go back to the Aeneas gem, you can see the great detail as Aeneas mounts the stairs to get in the ship. In the lower left, you can see even three sailors doing different things. One holds the rudder, one adjusts the sails, and another blows on a conch. And these are all carved with these small rotating tools. And if we rotate the gem, uh, you can see uh, from a different vantage point how the color of the gem changes. I love how the idea, if you turn this gem in your hand in the sunlight, the uh, reddish orange color of this cornelian, a stone also called carnelian, but I prefer cornelian because that's the ancient Roman term for the stone, it would glow and gleam as if replicating the fire of Troy. The elements that are appear to be standing out in the highest relief like the hero are actually cut more deeply so that if you press the stone into soft clay or wax or today silicon, the thing would stand out. So carvers are carving these in reverse, uh, cutting into the stone uh, on a miniature scale. And they would be used, some of them very much for display, for jewelry, but they were also functioning as symbols of uh, identity, insignia. And while we have thousands of gems from antiquity, we also have the evidence of lost gems through impressions on clay that survived from several sites throughout the Mediterranean. And this is a small selection from the uh, Hellenistic site of Kedesh in Israel on the borderlands between the Roman and the Seleucid Empire. And you can see a variety of images. The one in the lower left has the symbol uh, of, of the, the city. Uh, upper left, you have the goddess Artemis. You have the portrait of a king with the diadem. You have the Phoenician goddess Tanit, the Seleucid symbol, the uh, anchor, and lots of others. But interestingly enough, here on this anchor uh, ceiling, you even have the fingerprints of the person making the seal. And on this thunderbolt seal, you have the outline of the bezel of the ring. So we can, uh, through different kinds of remains, the gems themselves, the ceilings, as well as literary references, uh, understand better how these gems were used by people in antiquity. Now, there's another technique which is more recent, invented in the Hellenistic period, somewhere probably in the third century, probably in Ptolemaic Egypt, which is the cameo technique. And it's essentially the reverse of the intaglio technique. Instead of carving in the, the image into the gem, the background was carved away to create an image in relief. And these weren't used so much for ceiling, although occasionally we have evidence of that, but more for display. They could be mounted in rings as pendants on boxes, very much for display. And these were carved in multi-layered stones, usually what we call banded agate, or sardonyx, meaning a sard, a kind of cornelian with onyx. Uh, but uh, chemically, this is a banded agate. And here you see another example, this time a centaur uh, of a gem currently in Naples that was formerly in the gem collection of Lorenzo de' Medici, who carved his own name on it. But in the shot on the right, you can see the three layers of the stone, a dark layer, a white layer, and then another dark layer and how the centaur figure is carved very skillfully in relief. Cameos took a lot more work to carve than intaglios because as you can see here where I've taken those tools and overlaid them on the graphic, when you're carving into the stone to make an intaglio, you have a lot of surface contact between your rotating cutting tool, whether it's a wheel or a ball or a cone, 
uh, and the gem. But when you're cutting a cameo, you have only the most tangential surface and a lot more work to cut away. So cameos were more work. And also you had to carefully select and work with your stone. Cameos could be cut either dark on light or light on dark, depending on how the carver went about this. And depending on how much the carver cut through one layer, that layer might appear to be somewhat uh, translucent. You can see how the skin of this dancing satyr seems to be more of an orange, whereas his body, which is thicker, is darker. On, on these two cameos, you can see how the veil of the figure of Hermaphroditus almost seems to be transparent as it disappears into the background. Or on the cameo of the Emperor Trajan, the carver has exploited three layers, the dark, the light, and the other dark for the cloak and the wreath of the emperor. One of my favorites is this gem uh, in the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, formerly belonged to the kings of France, depicting Jupiter. And it's in a medieval mount. Uh, King Charles V uh, dedicated it to the Cathedral of Chartres in the 14th century. And it has an elaborate enamel and inscribed in inscription. But you can see, again, three layers, dark, light, and dark again, and how the carver has used the upper dark layer not only to emphasize the plumage of the eagle, the thunderbolt, the drapery of Jupiter and his hair, but even carved it lightly on his thigh and between his legs to give a sense of transparency, to create chiaroscuro. This is the thing painters do all the time, but here we're seeing it done in hard stone. I don't want to talk too much about technique because technique is something better observed than described. And so I encourage you all to uh, go online and just Google Getty, the art of gem carving. And this is a four minute video that shows a contemporary carver, Chavdar Chushev, uh, creating this replica ancient gem in our collection uh, from basically, you know, soup to nuts, from the quarry to the finished dam. And there's Chavdar uh, and, and his gem. And as I said, uh, the techniques are similar using these rotating tools, but Chavdar uses magnification, which we don't think the ancients used. We think being nearsighted was probably enough. And he uses power tools. For the ancient techniques and the ancient carvers, we have a variety of evidence in addition to the stones themselves. This is a reproduction of a tombstone of a young man, 18 years old, called Doros, who lived in the city of Sardis in, in modern Western Turkey uh, in the second century. Um, and uh, he was from Sardis, but his gemstone was, his tombstone was erected in Philadelphia in Asia Minor. And what it shows is fragmentarily a kind of bow driven lathe or spindle that as you pull the bow wrapped around the spindle back and forth, it would rotate and turn the gem cutter. And this is the technique that was used in uh, 17th century India, as you see here, and was used in modern Europe. Here it's published in 1750, uh, Pierre Mariette's treatise on engraved gems. And you can see in the engraving, he's got a spindle and his was actually turned by a foot pedal rather than by a bow. But at the bottom, you see various bits, wheels, balls, coin, uh, cones and engravers that he used to engrave gems. Uh, not so long ago, I encountered uh, this uh, short video on the internet that shows a modern Iranian engraver and you can see here how he dips the gem and the, the tip of his stick on which he holds the gem in an abrasive, because it's not the metal tools that cut the gem. Uh, steel, copper, bronze are softer than the gemstones. There's an abrasive that 
modern carvers use crushed diamonds, ancient carvers used emery or corundum, and they would charge their cutting wheels with this abrasive, as you see right now in the video, adding this abrasive paste in order to make the cuts. And while pulling the, turning the drill on with one side and adjusting the gem with the other hand, very complex uh, motifs, whether Arabic inscriptions or mythological scenes can be carved. Now the stones themselves, as I mentioned before, uh, were not precious by, most of them were not precious by our standards, at least not until the Eastern conquest of Alexander the Great, when sapphire, true sapphires or emeralds or rubies came in very small numbers, garnets, uh, to the Mediterranean world. Um, mostly the gems we have from Greco-Roman antiquity are more common stones, but still they have properties of bright colors of translucence that made them valuable. These would be amethysts, rock crystal, uh, cornelians, uh, agates, jaspers, chalcedonies, things that in a world before electricity would have magical and mystical powers. They would seem to contain light within them. They would move with the light. They would generate light. Uh, they would gleam. They are all mostly of seven or eight hardness on the Mohs scale. They're, they're mostly quartzes, microcrystalline, macrocrystalline quartzes and chalcedonies. Uh, they would be carved generally with something um, like emery, which was a form of corundum. Uh, diamonds were known. Uh, they could be used to scratch the surface and they're of course much harder. But to carve softer stones, you really only need sand, of which there was plenty in the ancient world, and well before the Greeks and the Romans, uh, other cultures also engraved stones to use as seals, to use as jewelry, to use as amulets, to display their status. We have engraved gemstones from the Minoan and Mycenaean world, such as this uh, lentoid, the lentil shape gem, um, that shows a bull leaper and it has a drill hole running through it. So it could be mounted on a string, a cord, a necklace. Of course, even before the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, the um, Mesopotamians, whether Babylonian or Assyrian, uh, and Sumerian created cylinder seals. Again, cutting into hard stones, but in this case on a cylinder. So the inscriptions could be unrolled. Here a presentation seen uh, to a king. And of course, in ancient Egypt, there were a variety of uses of hard stones, uh, whether on rings, but most popularly in the form of, of scarabs, of beetles, as you can see here above. The back of the seal takes the form of a scarab beetle, and then a motif, in this case, a lion, would be carved in it. And it was this form that was widely adapted in the archaic period in the Mediterranean, in Greece, and in Etruria. Here from our collection, for example, is a Cornelian scarab with a dancing satyr. Uh, you can see it's very much a, a Mediterranean, a Greco-Etruscan motif of this half man, half donkey dancing, uh, but the form is very much coming from the, the Middle East. The famous uh, 18th century German art historian, uh, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, once declared that you could tell the entire history of ancient art through gems alone. I'm not gonna try to do that today, but I wanna point out that we see several of the same motifs carved in the same styles in gems as we do in other arts, sculpture, vase painting. So one of the ways we can attribute and date these is through stylistic means. For example, here is an earlier geometric tabloid on a so soft stone, serpentine, that may be as hard to read, but you can see here on the far left, the figure of an archer shooting a bow at a half man, half horse, who's holding up branches, a centaur. And these are clearly carved in the geometric style 
of you know reduced abstract figures. Bodies are triangles, and in, in front presented frontally. Heads are circles presented in profile that we see in other arts, in geometric vases, in geometric goldwork. Then, from a later period, jumping forward to the fourth century, we see the motif of the nude crouching Aphrodite, a, a scene again that's very popular in uh, late classical and Hellenistic art, and in this case, again, carved on a scarab. And this one is actually on a swivel ring. And you can see how you could wear the ring as on the far left with the carving on the inside, the um, insignia. And when you wanted to make a ceiling, you'd take off the ring, you'd flip the stone, and you'd press the motif, and you'd get an impression, in this case, silicon, in, in, in reverse uh, into your material. So one way to track, to trace, to date the gems is by simply their shapes. These evolve over time, but there are overlaps. This uh, diagram, which is not something you should try to memorize, shows some of the shapes, the, the lentoids, the cylinders, the almond-shaped gems of the Bronze Age, the variety of scarabs and different typologies. Then we have scaraboids, which are scarab shaped, but not carved with full beetles. And these are a lot less work to carve. And if the form of the gem is less important than its material and its insignia, why bother carving the scarab? And many of the gems uh, carved in the classical and Hellenistic period are scaraboids. And this is a scaraboid, um, a wonderful gem carved in very low relief with a grasshopper on this wonderful mottled or brecciated jasper uh, with orange and black and red dots. Uh, it too is drilled all the way through so it could be mounted to a swivel ring. And you'll see from the uh, caption here that this gem has been attributed to Dexomenos. We know something, as I said, of the uh, artists who carved gems from ancient literary sources but also we know a lot from gems that actually bear their carver's names. This gem doesn't bear the carver's name, and Dexomenos is not mentioned by ancient literary sources. So how do we know about him? I want to take a step back and show you two earlier gems in the Gettys collection. The one on the left is a scaraboid of obsidian, black volcanic glass. Again, these are all about seven, seven and a half on the Mohs scale. And the gem on the right, a uh, cornelian, this one actually a scarab, and on the edge you could see a little bit of the beetle. Both show young men, muscular young men, lifting one foot. The one on the left is actually scraping the oil off of him. He's a scraper and epoxyominos, uh, and you can see he's very well muscled. There's a great interest in showing the muscles of his thigh, of his calf, of his abdomen. Um, legs are in profile, chest is frontal, abdomen is three quarters, face with large features is profile, and you can compare them uh, how similar they are to this uh, Cornelian, even down to the hatching motif. So I hope you would accept if I suggest these two unsigned gems are carved by the same person. Epimenes, I've told you in the caption. Why Epimenes? Because we're fortunate to have in the Boston Museum this spectacular Chalcedony, uh, which says Epimenes Epoye, Epimenes made this. And you can see the letters here are carved in reverse so that when you make the impression, they can be read forward, Epimenes Epoye. And it's exquisite gem showing a youth in three quarter back view with uh, profile face, great attention to anatomy, restraining this, this horse uh, and wonderful details of the, um, the bridle and the other uh, accoutrements of horse taming. And in fact, bridging the gap between this three quarter back view and the three quarter front view of the two Getty gems, there are two other gems 
in the upper left-hand corner, now in New York, in the upper right-hand corner, also in Boston, of crouching archers. And in all of these gems, we see the same elements um, that I've described before and won't, won't repeat. So we have a cluster of gems that we can attribute to the carver Epimenes who signed the one in Boston in the center. Throughout antiquity, not just you know, um, famous artists, but many people sign their works of art, whether they're signing vases or sculptures or metal reliefs or coins or even bricks. This is something we see much more for the Greek period where the artists are assertive than for the Roman period. So if we return to our grasshopper, which I've told you we've attributed to Dexamenos or his circle, we can do that because we have a handful of exquisite gems signed by Dexamenos. This one also in Boston, also on sort of a mottled jasper, so a stone that the carver uh, seems to have been familiar with, was formerly owned by Sir Arthur Evans, the excavator of Knossos on Crete, which is why I show you his picture here. But the gem is signed by Dexamenos, and this time, this one is not carved in reverse, or the inscription is not carved in reverse, it's carved to be read directly on the stone. So we've got to think about how these things were used. Were they used more for display or for sealing? Um, Dexamenos carved his letters very carefully, just like he carved this wonderful figure where you can really even down to the eyelashes, every uh, lock of hair is, is described. He carved the inscription in a style known as stoikidon in a row, which was used for inscriptions in official documents at Athens. Uh, the gem was found in the outskirts of Athens. And you can see how all the letters in the inscription here line up in a row, just like they do on the inscription. But Dexamenos's most famous gem today was actually found on the shores of the Black Sea. This heron uh, in a blue calcidony, now in the Hermitage State Museum, Again, signed to be read directly on the stone, not cut in reverse, uh, of this blue heron, of this heron also flying through the blue sky. And the inscription gives us one more piece of information about Dexamenos. Dexamenos epoie, Dexamenos made this kios, the kiot from kios. We know that Dexamenos from this signature uh, is from the island of kios, right up against the, the coast of Turkey. We have a couple of other gems signed by Dexamenos. This one, the signature you'll see is down in the lower right, again, to be read on the stone. And above it says, Mikes, of Mike, of uh, the little one. Um, this seems to be a nickname for the woman, presumably, who owned this gem, Mikes. And she's shown seated on a stool with transparent drapery, with uh, weights at the corners of her drapery, everything down to her joints and muscles of her feet are wonderfully carved before a servant who holds a mirror and a wreath for her. The mirror, of course, in the Middle Ages becomes a sign of vanity, but in ancient Greece, the mirror was a symbol of beauty. And we can see the same kind of imagery again in different art forms, such as on this Athenian funerary lekathos of the uh, early fourth century, about the same time as the gem. Uh, one other gem bears Dexamenos' signature, another brachiated jasper, uh, rather broken, found again in the Black Sea, where uh, Dexamenos seems to have had an active export business unless he traveled there himself. These things are highly portable, obviously, so we don't know if Dexamenos moved around carving wherever he went or just shipped his gems. We have later evidence for both, for traveling artists and for the transport of gems. But we have another heron, this one turning back to pluck at its wings, and beneath its claw is a grasshopper. And that, of course, is the link to our gem. Here's another gem from the Black Sea, probably by Dexamenos, but unsigned. Again, you can see the similar similarity of motif of style, even of material. But here's the comparison I promised you between uh, the grasshopper taking up the entire gem and 
Dexaminos's signed grasshopper. So this is the means for attribution. But as with other arts, especially vase painting, not all of the best gems are signed. I want to share with you this one of Perseus on a, a red modeled jasper. Uh, and we recognized him because he has given to him by Hermes, sort of a winged headband and winged sandals, but he's going off secretly, pensively with his thumb raised to his lips with a spear, but also a hooked blade. This is the harpe of ancient literature with which he's going to decapitate the Gordon, Gorgon Medusa. This is slightly larger. It's maybe you know an inch instead of half an inch tall. Um, these again are carved on a minute scale with amazing detail. If you look at the musculature of uh, the hero, uh, the details of his, here you go, you know, the joints of his fingers, uh, the joint of his wrist bone, the wonderful uh, bulky anatomy of this uh, splendid view of his torso. If you go down and look at the wings of his sandals and his feet, shown the right one behind in profile, the left one twisted out in, in three-quarter view. This is exquisite carving by a carver we have yet to identify. One of my favorites of our gems is this one. This is an amethyst intaglio of Demosthenes by Dioscorides. Amethyst is the stone. It's this translucent uh, purplish stone uh, that to this day remains popular. Uh, in antiquity, it was thought to have special properties. Uh, Mephi is the ancient word for drunkenness. And amethyst was thought to be um, without drunkenness or against drunkenness, just like asymmetrical is not symmetrical. Um, so because it's wine colored, it was thought to be proof against drunkenness and is frequently used for images of the god Dionysus. In this case, it's a um, intaglio that depicts uh, the ancient orator Demosthenes and we know of Demosthenes from many, many portraits in other materials such as this marble. He was a great orator and protector of Athens. And he actually uh, was fighting against Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon, and committed suicide and had honorific portraits erected to him in the uh, uh, third century BC. Our gem dates a couple hundred years later, and we know that because it's signed by Dioscorides. You can see the minute letters. These are less than a millimeter tall. This entire gem is, you know, the size again of, you know, the last joint of your thumb, and the detail in it is extraordinary, far beyond the marbles and other versions. It's not unique to depict Demosthenes on a gem. But usually portraits and gems are done in profile. And here's another Demosthenes that formerly belonged to the Danish sculptor uh, Thorvaldsen that's now in Copenhagen. And you can see it's carved in a Niccolo, a layered stone, kind of a reverse cameo where the intaglio is cut through one color into the other color of the stone. And we can recognize the orator. And we even have uh, a wonderful but damaged profile Demosthenes carved deeply signed by the carver Apelles, who takes his name from a famous Greek painter. Some of you may have heard of the painter Apelles uh, in this Cornelian that seems to have been burnt. And that's why it's, it's striated. But um, now we have these two wonderful Demosthenes gems, both signed by Greek artists, both probably working in Rome. We know about Dioscorides because he's one of the very few gem engravers who's actually mentioned by ancient writers, uh, Suetonius and Diocasius. Both tell us that uh, he carved 
the seal of the Emperor Augustus. So we've got work from Emperor Augustus's gem engraver on your left. And Demosthenes seems to have been so popular because while Demosthenes in the fourth century wrote against Philip, the Philippics in the first century BC, Cicero attacking Mark Antony wrote a series of speeches he called Philippics. So Demosthenes was a model for Cicero and was a model for anti-Antonian politics. And so you all know that in the end, Augustus defeated Mark Antony, the Demosthenic, we might say, faction was victorious. And these multiple rings, uh, gemstones, depicting Demosthenes probably showed support either for Cicero's Republican leanings or Octavian Augustus's own anti-Antonian uh, leanings. And of course, we know, as I said, from the literary sources that Dioscorides eventually carved the personal seal of Augustus. We don't have that gem, unfortunately, but we have other gems from uh, Dioscorides uh, there's just a detail of Demosthenes, uh, although it's you can see close up, it's slightly damaged, chipped around the edges, a little chipping in the eyes, but the workmanship is truly extraordinary. Also from Dioscorides, we have now in Berlin, uh, this cameo in high relief, beautifully polished of the Greek hero Heracles uh, wrestling the Hellhound Cerberus. This gem was in the collection of the uh, electors of Brandenburg. And there's plausible evidence that it was shown to Michelangelo at one point, And he said it was the most extraordinary thing he had ever seen. This Cornelian intaglio shows Diomedes, the Greek hero at Troy, who committed the sacrilege of trying to steal the Palladian the sacred statue of Troy and killing a priest inside. Uh, again, a wonderful carving. This belongs and still belongs to the uh, Duke of Devonshire. Uh, in the 1850s, his ancestors took their collection of ancient gems and mounted them into this extraordinary uh, set of jewelry, a bracelet. Here's the Dioscorides gem here, a tiara, and a chest plate, uh, all for um, Maria Countess Granville to wear to the coronation of Tsar Nicholas Alexander II in 1856. Now, I've been showing you some of the very best ancient engraved gems I know of. And this really perhaps is misleading uh, because you're seeing the best of the best but there were also gems carved at all levels of quality. Here, for example, is a small green plasma gem set in a bronze ring uh, that shows the same scene. You have Diomedes sitting on the altar with one leg extended, one leg bent back, holding uh, a, a dagger in his left hand with a statue on the, in his right of Athena, and then a statue that turns its back to him because uh, he's misbehaved in the other. This is the same motif, but you can, I think, I hope, discern the difference in skill between Dioscorides, the gem carver of Augustus, and this anonymous piece. Um, we can also attribute to Dioscorides unsigned gems, such as the one on the left, another one that Lorenzo de' Medici carved his own name into, or had his own name carved into in the Renaissance that depicts the god Apollo holding a lyre uh, seated next to the satyr Marcius, who's tied to a tree because he's lost the contest with the god and ends up getting flayed. And sitting down below is uh, the nephew of Marcius pleading for mercy. This gem was very famous in the Renaissance. Here you can see a Renaissance bronze cast made of it, again, in, in reverse. And here you can see uh, a replica of the gem, 
uh, featured in this beautiful portrait of Simonetta Vespucci by Sandro Botticelli. Gems have been not only worn and admired and collected in and of themselves, but they've inspired artists in other media like Botticelli, like the painters of medieval manuscripts who you see have put wonderful little engraved gems and unengraved gems in the margins of their prayer book. Uh, others, ceramicists who have used these uh, gemological motifs in the dec decoration of their plates, not only in the Renaissance, but also up through the 18th century when there was a great vogue for collecting gems. Uh, collectors not only prized their gems, uh, but displayed them to others and created great catalogs. This is one of the earliest of the corrector, Abraham Gorlais in Antwerp. And you can see there's the man himself showing you some of his collection of gems. And if you turn the pages, you see in line drawings, the shape of the rings, the motifs of the gems. And in Latin, somewhat abbreviated, you have an anellus, a ring in argentum in silver with a gem of onyx that's incised, etc. So these are how gems were promulgated among collectors and scholars throughout the uh, early modern period. And they were, as I say, very highly prized. This is the frontispiece of the gem collection of the Duc d'Orléans, the brother of the French king. And what it shows is something we don't think about today. It shows in this allegory, underneath the light of learning is the personification of gem engraving surrounded by these cupids with books and boxes with drawers and dorms of gems. She is being admired and looked to by the personifications of the other arts. Architecture here with the calipers and ruler. Sculpture with the chisel, hammer, and a bust. And painting with the brushes. Gem engraving was the leader of the arts in this period. And collectors uh, would also gather together uh, impressions of gems in plaster or sulfur, have them in books, and there were great collections of replicas and gems. I want to end, though, returning to an idea I mentioned earlier of the gems really inspiring other artists. Many of you, I assume, have been to Florence. You may have gone to the Palazzo Medici and visited inside the spectacular frescoes in the Chapel of the Magi by Benozzo Gozzoli. But if you go through the courtyard of the palace, you may not have noticed uh, in the frieze above these arches are a series of roundels, the Medici crest of six balls, but on either side, all the way around are um, two times four, eight reliefs showing scenes extracted from gems built very large, carved in marble. Here is uh, Diomedes with the Palladium. Here's another Daedalus preparing Icarus for his flight based on a cameo, again, that was in Lorenzo de Medici's collection. And then another one, Athena and Poseidon in the struggle for control of Athens. You'll remember Poseidon gives Athens a saltwater spring, but Athena gives Athens the olive, so she is the winner. And this was the same scene that was in the uh, west gable of the Parthenon. More recently, it's been suggested that this gem, currently in the collection of the Dukes of Northumberland in Northern England, uh, an incredible cameo with fantastic detail showing this muscular youth riding the back of a Capricorn uh, across the sea, the Capricorn being the birth sign of the Emperor Augustus. And this youth has some features that some have thought to be Augustus. This too, it's been argued, was inspirational. It was in the Renaissance in the collection of Cardinal Domenico Grimani of Venice, who was also resident in Rome. And here you can see an engraving uh, from the late 15th century. And here you can see a chalk drawing by Michelangelo. There's no 
external evidence that Michelangelo actually saw this gem, but given the engraving, the importance of gems and gem collecting among rich patrons and their inspiration to artists, it's not, I think, at all unreasonable, as some have suggested, that this cameo uh, lays behind one of the greatest masterpieces we know uh, from the Renaissance. So there's a lot of aspects of ancient glyptic gem engraving that I've tried to touch on today, a lot more that I haven't, but we have time now for questions and I'll just put a few more gems on the screen as we um, move to the Q&A. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you so much, Ken, for this wonderful lecture with, I have to say, uh, amazing photos of exquisite um, gems. Uh, I would like to remind um, everyone to put your uh, question in the Q&A and we'll go through them and try to answer as many as um, we can. And um, I, I really enjoyed your, your talk, uh, Ken, because this past summer, um, I was studying the gem that you listed uh, earlier on in your slides, which is about the size of my pinky nail. Uh, it is minuscule, um, but the carving on it is lovely. And um, just last week or the week before, we actually took an impression of it for the first time to really see what that motif is. Because our big debate was, is the thing next to Bacchus's leg a panther has that that's what has been described or a tree trunk and we're more um leaning towards a tree trunk rather than a panther um so it's um yes I, i've enjoyed um your talk um very much let's me let me pull up the document and There's see if we have questions um let's see um, how do the gems range in size? Yeah, um, they range in size. The smallest could be the size of, you know, your pinky fingernail. And the largest I didn't show you is very famous that we have from antiquity. Well, we have several, they're, they're, they're large cameos, the so-called Tazza Farnese in Naples from the Hellenistic period the Grand Came de France, also an that's a later imperial uh, cameo that, you know, they could be maybe, you know, eight inches square at, at, at the largest. Uh, some of these materials, uh, rock crystal, uh, banded agate, were also cut into vessels so that you could make drinking cups out of them. And sometimes they'd have um, motifs uh, engraved on the outside, florals or, or figure heads. And those were done by the same carvers, but obviously they weren't used for seals, they were used for display, they were used for banquets. And again, uh, on the scale of things, top hard stone vessels, then gold, then silver, then bronze, you know, then, then marble, then ceramic, you know. So what's remarkable is, how much our discipline for a variety of reasons historically has come to privilege things like marble sculpture because we have a lot of it or Greek vases because we have a lot of it. Um, and those weren't necessarily the most important objects to the ancients. Uh, these things uh, clearly from the literary sources and others uh, had the admiration and, and, and they were useful because not only as steels because they were thought to have magical properties, they could protect you, they could keep you from getting drunk. They were thought to make you a better speaker, to heal you if you were sick. You could grind them up and, and swallow them, uh, which the Medici also did. Um, so not that these things were necessarily true, but they were believed. And you've sort of touched on, on one of the questions that just popped up on the screen. Like to what extent do you think the magical properties of the gemstones were considered by the people who wore them? Was it very important or just a sort of secondary um, consideration? I, I think I think we we on a case by case basis, some were very important. Some are inscribed with magical formulae and prayers. Some of them, the motif on them. Um, can have scenes of birth, the red stone, 
was sometimes thought to ease menstrual pains. So the stone, the motif on it, and an inscription give you kind of like a triple punch of magic and medicine, and these things were bound together. Other things, um, it could be more political. The Demosthenes, I think, is more political than magical. You know, if you're carrying um, the image of, of an emperor, um, we know that Augustus's personal seal was carved by Dioscorides. We don't have that. We have lots of images of Augustus on gems, and these would have been carved and worn by his supporters and adherents, right? And so um, that's not magical per se. Um, green stones were thought to be good for the vision, and they were often carved with symbols of lizards that were thought to have good vision in antiquity. So you could wear one of those if you wanted to ensure your vision or if you had failing vision. So I think on a case by case basis, sometimes we can have confidence that there was a lot of importance to this magical element. In other cases, we can't be entirely sure. Um, you just mentioned Augustus a few times and is, is there a reason why there's so many gems um, of Augustus with his portrait that survived? Is it because of his supporters, as you just mentioned, or fluke? Or well, I think reason? it's because of his supporters. He also had a very, very long, long reign. Um, and it seems that this gem of his, um, carved by Dioscorides, remained the imperial seal for his successors through the Julio-Claudians. Um, so, it, it, it became kind of an official image and must have looked something like, you know, Augustine coinage. Uh, we know that he had gems before the Dioscorides gem. We're, we're told uh, by ancient historians that when he was um, first adopted by Caesar and became involved in politics as a young man, he found in his mother's jewelry box two identical intaglios of a sphinx. And he used that for his early seal. And he gave one to Agrippa, his right-hand man. So Agrippa could act in his name. And we find early coins of Augustus that have the Sphinx on them. But people um, began to talk whenever they got uh, you know, a, a letter that was sealed with the impression of a Sphinx. You know, they weren't sure if it was good or bad. The Sphinx is kind of an uneven character. You, know, uh, you don't know what it's going to mean. So he got rid of the Sphinx, and his second seal, we're told, was an image of Alexander the Great. Maybe Alexander the Great seal by the great gem engraver Pergodiles, one of the other few mentioned by ancient sources. But that had, with time, connotations of conquest, of imperial rule, and Augustus wanted to be this good Roman, the return to the good old days. So his third seal seems to have been his own portrait. So we know a lot about Augustus and his portrait. But we also know that like the Ptolemaic kings, the Seleucid kings, uh, his supporters wore his image on rings. But we also know that Epicureans wore images of Epicurus on their rings. It was a way to signal your affiliation. I don't know, is it like the way people wear brands on their t-shirts or, or caps now to signal their affiliations? Although this was somewhat more expensive, but the lower end gems carved with less detail on a smaller scale uh, although still expensive, weren't, you know, princely uh, possessions like most of these I'm showing you on the screen. Uh, you just mentioned the Seleucids, and I have a question here. Um, are there any cameo style Seleucid gems? Did they typically have the anchor symbol on them? Um, the anchor, which I show you here in the ceiling uh, from Kadesh, uh, the Seleucid symbol also appears a lot on ceilings that have been preserved from other uh, Hellenized cities in Mesopotamia, from Seleucia, also from Egypt, because these were also part of official correspondence. Magistrates would use them to, to seal. I'm not aware of cameos uh, with uh, the anchor on them, which doesn't mean they, they don't exist. Um, but we do have a lot of a lot of gems. Cameos were more for display, it seems, and less for use as as sealing documents. I have a more general question about the carvers themselves. Like, were they rever mm -hmm. revered and appreciated in their day? 
Um, and it, <laughs> at least from your lecture, some of them seem to be revered today, certainly. And were they paid well? Um, Do we know anything about that? We, 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 have, we have little scattered bits of evidence. There are, as I said, some gem carvers whose names were well enough known that they're mentioned by ancient writers and poets. Um, uh, a few decades ago, a papyrus of a group of poems written at the Ptolemaic court in Alexandria by uh, Poseidippus, the Macedonian poet, uh, was found a, a bunch of um, poems uh, called the Lithica on, on stones. And he writes about gemstones and how beautiful they are and they're coming from exotic lands and they were given as gifts to beautiful women and how nature has been transformed, all of these motifs all around the court and several engravers are named. This is before Dioscorides, so he's, he's not named, uh, but others, others gem engravers are named. And so these were celebrity artists, you know, like celebrity artists today, but most gem engravers were just working away doing their thing. They were dealing with precious objects. Um, they were working also with goldsmiths, if not as goldsmiths themselves, making mounts for their objects. So they probably weren't poor. Um, although it's possible that some of them were enslaved like many ancient craftsmen. They were, um, but they had a privileged position because slavery in antiquity was not, you know, the equivalent, not that um, there weren't terrible experience if you were a slave, you know, in, in, in the mines, mining for the gemstones, that would have been a pretty awful life. But if you were a skilled craftsman, uh, you probably would have done very well. We don't know the exact prices across the board. We have some evidence that a, a, an engraved gem could cost a drachma, which is not so expensive. It's, we thought, the wage of a skilled workman. There's a wonderful story uh, that Pliny the Elder tells about um, an ancient musician whose name was Ismenius in the fourth century. He was kind of a liberace, he was a rock star, and he liked to wear lots of jewels and fancy clothes. And he learned about a gem that was for sale in Cyprus um, for, for four gold coins. And he sent presumably one of his trusted um, slaves or servants to go buy it. And Pliny tells us that the servant came back with the gem and tells Ismenius that when the sellers learned who the buyer was, they gave him a discount. And Ismenius was furious because that lowered the value of the gem. He wanted to pay more for it. Um, uh, but you know what the average gem costs, it's hard to say. And presumably, you know, one of these works by Dioscorides carved with lots of labor and lots of detail would be you know, much uh, more expensive than one that's more coarserly carved. So if I quickly scroll over here to that comparison I showed you, you know, the gem on the left versus the gem on the right. Also, you know, there's the materials of the gem. Certain stones could have been more valuable. We don't really know. The size of the gemstone matters. Also, gem dealers in antiquity as today would make up stories about where they're from. Some of the gems did come from Afghanistan or India, but others could have come from much closer, but the gem dealers could have made up stories about where they came from and that would add to their value. Excellent, thank you. I have two questions related about related to the, the use of the gems. Uh, question number one, were Bule carved for Roman use, use for ID or protection? Um, I think that's what the question is. There's a two part. Uh, so Bet Bettina, if that's not correct, uh, let us know. So were those carved for Roman use for ID or protection? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, they weren't quite ID the way we have our ID that if you want to prove you're you, you show them your gem. You, you, you'd seal a letter or a box um, or a door with your seal and then you'd come back and if your seal were intact, you'd know no one was in there. So that kind of protection. If someone broke open your seal, they could do that. It's just that it showed and you'd have evidence of that. And we have stories, for example, in, in, in the Greek tragedian Aeschylus, Electra 
recognizes her brother Orestes because he has the seal ring of their father Agamemnon passed down as an heirloom. So in that sense, their ID, they're closely bound to personal identity, right? So that's one of the things. But if you were a magistrate, you could have two. You could have your personal seal that came from your father or that, or that you commissioned, but you could have an official seal that came with your office. And in antiquity, we had gem collectors, just like today, we have evidence of people loving these things and gathering as, as many as they can. And then of course, some of them, the motifs on them did have some kind of personal resonance and they also served as amuletic, magical or protective purposes. So all of that's mixed together and it's difficult for us at this distance to unpack any one gem and what it meant. But there are bodies um, found at Herculaneum. There's a body of a woman who was wearing uh, two, two gems one carved and one uncarved, I believe. And the carved one shows a hen with little chicks. Does that mean, you know, she had children and this is her and her children? Or is that just us making up narratives for her? We don't know. She could have been a chicken farmer. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and the, the last question for today, just the second in the, in the, the function of these um, objects, for swivel rings specifically, are most of the motifs meant to be shown, um, you know, like visible, or are they more political, controversial subjects that could be hidden when it's swiveled and it's on the inside? I Certainly it could, I think the gem was meant to be worn with the intaglio, the device on the inside, really more to protect it. So, you know, if you don't, you know, even these are hard stones, they can chip, they can crack if you're wearing them day to day and bang them around. So you could then swivel to make your impression. One of the things that's quite interesting is that I've shown you throughout this talk, you know, beautiful photographs of these carvings. In real life, they're often much harder to see unless you have the opportunity to hold them up in the right light at the right angle. And so a motif like this, in this very um, brecciated stone, or even more, the grasshopper, you know, I should take a photo just, you know, from the thing, you know, in the, in the museum vitrine where it's now on display, it's often hard to see. So there's also something magical with the image seeming to appear out of nowhere. And the poets talk about this, whether you wet the stone, suddenly an image pops, or you have a, a stone and you make an impression, an image appears, there's something magical about that um you know but i think as far as the swivel rings it's probably more protection of the image than hiding something that, that, that that's secret although there could be a big reveal i guess well thank you so much ken for your answers and your wonderful lecture and for everybody who attended um and asked questions Maria, do you have final words for us? Uh, yes, I just want to thank um, everyone for being part of this fantastic lecture. Thank you, Kenneth, for this very fascinating presentation and for sharing uh, this insight and knowledge with us. I learned so much. Um, and thank you, Caroline, for doing a fantastic job moderating our Q&A session. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We hope uh, we look forward to having you at our upcoming events and exhibitions. There's uh, plenty more coming up, uh, virtual lectures as well. So take a look at our website. We have plenty for everyone. Thank you, everyone.